Hi, I'm Paul. This is the Creality CR10S S5. CR10 because the control box over here weighted down with a U-band can so it doesn't flop over. We'll get to that in a bit. It's separate. The, the Creality Pros, the box and controls are fit underneath the machine. I kind of prefer it being separate. It's a little more modular and you can hack on it and improve it a little better. The S means it's got that filament out sensor. You can maybe see right there. And uh, there was one other thing that that did. Oh, if power goes down, you can recover. It writes a little binary, BIN file, to the disk that you were bringing the G code in on. And it constantly writes that with every move. So if power goes down, you can bring it up. Unfortunately, if power goes down, you'll lose bed heat. Bed heat without bed heat, my parts are coming off just picking them up. I just plain glass, we'll get all those things. But before I criticize, and there's some quality control stuff and other stuff. Oh, I forgot to mention, it's an S5, means it's 500 millimeters, 510 by 510. So it's a huge machine. And before I criticize it, look at this. This is a prototype Harley case I want to design for sportsters. I've got even a more impressive one with a starter motor in it, the other half of that case. It's just unbelievable. I got a camera above and one to the side. Maybe you can, uh, might be better. We'll see. Ah, we can, I mean, just look at this. It's beautiful. So before the criticism start, remember the kind of large parts that you can get out of this. The, the big one over here took four days of printing. I think this one was two. As I went, I turned the speeds up and learned how to you know, fudge things to make it faster. Now let's go into the problems I had, quality control with the machine, uh, some design things that I thought could be a little better, and then mostly operator error, because this was the first 3D printing I've done, all right? So the quality control things right out of the box, and the packaging was beautiful. It was drop shipped uh, from China, came quickly. I bought it through Sane Smart. I'm not too thrilled with them because of some of these issues I had. They weren't as much help as I'd hoped that an American-based distributor would be. Maybe uh, another distributor would be better, but for right now, no real complaints about any of that. The machine's $1,000, a little under, a little over, but it, that's the kind of class of machine. And for $1,000, to be able to make huge parts like this accurately, phenomenally accurately, uh, it's worth every penny to me. So there's no complaints about that. This is just to talk about what I've learned and some of the quality issues. So the first thing, as I unpacked it, it comes, this big piece comes separate. These four little screws, on, on, they're not really ball screws because they're not balls, but the, the little lead screws here. The nuts for the lead screw have two little screws over here, two little screws over here. They weren't just a little loose. They were way loose, like, you know, 3 sixteenths, I don't know, you know, way, way up. And of course, they give you a little tool kit. So before I even turned it on or tried anything, I knew to tighten those down. Here, let me take a picture so you can see exactly where we're talking about. These screws right here and right there. So we'll get, we'll get those shot up and you'll be able to see precisely where I'm talking about. Then the next issue was a loose pulley back here on the Y, and that took forever to figure out. They give you a, a spool, a little white spool of white uh, PLA to start with. I ran through that whole spool and still hadn't figured out that it was loose. The, the way it manifests, first I made the little can program, which I don't recommend because it's got some goofy moves and leaves little stringers that it shouldn't have to. Uh, that was included on the, the card. Uh, this, this little, I forget the file name, but don't even bother. The next thing I did was, oh, I'm sorry. If my friends who are real smart, they looked at this and said, oh, you got level shifting. Because you could see, I don't know if I can bring it in here. You could see, through this camera, you could see that there's very subtle, you got to be really good eye to see that. I did a little bench sheet. The bench sheet you can download from Thingiverse. This is the standard test thing. It shows how to do overhangs, stuff like that. That I thought I was doing OK. Then I did what? I did a quarter size of this jig I want to make for a Harley uh, transmission. 
didn't see a problem yet. Then it's like I got brave. Let's work up to it. This is what the white PLA that comes with the printer. Then I went half size. This is where you can see the problem. Let's see if I can get up here. I wish it was in better focus, but you can start to see there's level shifting here. This is supposed to be perfectly smooth. And there's all these level shifts. I'll take a picture of that, too, so you can see. Hopefully, you'll be able to see. And of course, with level shifting, I thought, so I'm an electronics guy, I thought I was getting skips. The stepper motor was skipping. It was just a loose pulley. There's two set screws. You loosen the one on the round completely, tighten really good the one that's on the flat. That uh, aligns it to the flat. Then you go to the other set screw and tighten that one. Not crazy tight, moose cholock tight, but pretty tight. So I went through this one. Let's just start throwing them over here. Then this is number three. Still had level shift. All the time, I'm adjusting speeds and adjusting feeds and fast traverse, thinking I got to stop this thing skipping steps. Wasn't skipping steps. Here's the next one. Here's the last one. I think I ran out of filament on this, number five. Still hadn't found out it was simply a loose pulley. All that was pre-assembled. It's not like something I left loose. And let's see, here's two more. What are these? One slow, one fast. OK, so here, ah, I figured it out. By the time I bought some from Sane Smart, I bought some black PLA. That has problems, and I definitely, I'll put a picture up. Don't buy this stuff, because it had a lot of problems. Uh, now I've got it smooth. The skips are over. I have slow, because of course I slowed everything way down to try to get the, uh, the, the level shifting gone. And then I went up to fast speeds, 4,800 uh, millimeters per minute, which is 80 millimeters per second. And, and that's both for the rapid traverses and for the printing, which is hauling pretty good. Uh, I've heard people brag faster, but for me, it was fast enough. It got the times down to you know days. This happened, I don't know, four or five hours for this. Two, two days for this one, four days for that big piece. So solve that quality control problem. All right, I want to show you another quality problem. I forgot uh, until I had to fire it up to remind myself. This fan rattles, and so if you do next, bring that. I thought it was a bracket. I messed around. I loosened everything. So this fan's bad. Needs to be replaced. I don't even know if I'll bother with Sane Smart. Maybe if I write them and tell them, they'll send me a fan. Of course, it'd be a big tear up. I'd probably just splice it in here. So that's a quality issue. Here's another quality issue on this extruder. Let's see if I can back out a little bit. There. There we go. This white pulley, the, the silver pulley, I jammed it. The silver pulley here stopped. That's because I think the, the white PLA they ship it with, it actually scrutched and ground and ground and ground and was running dry. That, this silver pulley got jammed and would not turn. So subsequently, I noticed I couldn't tell right away. I got a red magic marker. I put some red dots on the brass pulley. And then the idler pulley is this silver one. I put some red dots there. And it happened twice. It happened the first time after that disaster with the white PLA that uh, didn't come off the end of the roll and it just pulled everything over in almost disaster time. And then it did it again. I did it fixed it real time. I had a fine pair of electro electronics, electronics needle nose. And I just got in there and kept working this silver pulley as the part was running, and I got it loose. Now it seems to be loose, but that's a good tip for you. Put some little dots on these pulleys so you can make sure that the silver one is truly idling and it's not just jammed. Another quality issue. The next, I don't know you want to call it quality or call it design, the cables are too short. See this spool here? It's supposed to mount the other way. There's this angled bracket. Let's see if I can move my U-band can full of Harley parts to weight this thing down, because it really wants to fall over, right? Bam. That bracket's supposed to go the other way. And you write Sane Smart and say, see the cable to, I'll tell you exactly what. Oh, it's to both. The Y motor and the Y limit switch 
is so short, you can only get this about this far away. And then and you put this with the angled bracket here and that it gets too close, at least for me. I'll try messing with it some more. Maybe I can figure out some way moving this back. But to me, that's a quality problem. So that, was, that issue arose. The next quality problem, once again, maybe a design problem, it's the levelness. Let's see if I can put this down here, or we'll just take it out. You can see the machine and its infinite beauty. This bar has to be level. Some guys screw up. They adjust the table to some arbitrary angle to match the arbitrary angle of that. That's not the way to do things. You want this completely parallel and flat to the base. Then the table you adjust to be flat to this, and life is good. The way mine came, this side, this is the motor side, this is the floating side, it's, it's a little high on this side, you know, as you, as you run it. Don't move it too fast. I'm not even going to do this. Well, you can. Now, you can skew it, right? You can grab these two rods, these lead screws, and turn them kind of counter to each other, and you'll actually move that. That's probably, the, if it's not too far out of tilt, that's probably the right way to do it. Uh, the way I, I started to do it, I had this parallel, and I'd put a parallel here underneath, and I'd put a parallel down here, and you can still see it, under the, under the bar, and I'd just bring it down until it skips steps on one side. Not the smart thing to do. That was really hacker, and I apologize for that. But, but then I realized you can disable the steppers in the firmware, keep everything running, and then just kind of hack it a little. Now, there's a thing online where they say, oh, well, if you got this tramming problem, you got to take this off up here, you got to remove this whole thing, and then adjust the screws that mount this bar to this metal frame. I think there may be a simpler hack where if you loosen these uh, rollers, what you're trying to do, this is the movable roller. There's a single movable roller. Let me see if I can move this very carefully. Go slow, because it makes electricity, and it'll go back into the controller. Uh, there's a single roller here on this side, and two out here. So I think another way to get that tram without taking the whole machine apart is to loosen it here, loosen those rollers here, and then keep messing with, with the rollers the slop that's in these two fixed rollers, right? Because there's a hole and a screw goes through it. Hopefully there's just enough slop in there that you can level the thing out so that when you tighten the adjustable roller and get the, the three triangulated so then it's stiff, that this bar is level. I'm going to do that one of these days. For now, I just turn off the steppers and kind of level it by hand, to then do some moves and then make sure that it stayed as level as I can make it within, you know, 10, maybe 20 thousandths, it gets pretty level. And then once the steppers are energized, well, that's the beauty about this newer model. It's got screws on both sides. This big, it's so big they had to do that. So it's got lead screws on both sides, the steppers clamp in, and then make sure that it stays level for the four days of printing or whatever you want to do. So that was an issue. Once again, might not be called a quality issue, but especially on the rollers on the bed that goes back and forth, they use some kind of waxy lube that leaves these little angel wing spirals of frosty stuff. I'll take a picture, maybe you can see it. There's one I noticed for all the moving. So there's the picture. All six of them, or however many down there, were shedding this. Most of them I either wiped off or pulled off. I think it's just some kind of lubricant that's getting squeezed constantly by the balls and working its way out in those little cylindrical kind of gossamer danglies. Doesn't do any harm, but it can't be good. I'd rather have a permanent lubricant that doesn't squeeze out. Minor hack. You see, this is all getting to be yeah. minor stuff now. The last complaint isn't so much, I have, I'm not sure if there's any problems with the filament, the white filament on the small roll that, that uh, Saint Smart or Creality shipped from China. But I bought a roll from Saint Smart. Here's a picture I found of that roll. And that stuff I do not recommend for several reasons. Primarily, it's brittle. So, so it would be kind of flexy, 
But after it sat for a day, it would snap. And I got a, I forget where I put the pieces. I got pieces and you can just go crack, crack, crack. Now this is Hatchbox stuff from Amazon. It doesn't work. Hatchbox stuff is still flexible. Right? It won't, see, the, the, uh, that brand that I got from Sane Smart, uh-uh. It would, it would have snapped, especially sitting out. This has been idle for weeks now, one, two weeks. Uh, final quality thing, this. The Bordon tube and the, the cable to the head hung so low that it would hit the part, it would drag on the bed. Once I got smart, this will be in my tips section of this towards the end, I put the, uh, the clip that holds the glass to the aluminum, I put it in the middle here, and sure enough, this caught that and ripped uh, a print off. You know, it ripped the glass, moved the glass, ruined the print, uh, and I didn't hear it. So that was kind of embarrassing, coming back and seeing it. Of course, I was checking quite frequently. I've got this in a spare bedroom. So I guess that's about all the quality issues. The filament, this, the, the killer thing was that cost me a whole spool, which Shane Smart or Creality didn't seem very interested in giving me the spool back because they left this pulley on loose. And there's a, a communications problem going on as well because it goes from Chinese to somebody here in English at Shane Smart, and then they don't know what's going on. So they didn't want to give me another roll. Well, that's life. But still, those things added up to... Is it plug and play, like one of the more expensive? Certainly, I don't know anything this big that you know, isn't thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. No. So overall, I'm delighted. Now that I've been through all that misery and all the profanity, trying to get it right, and I have gotten it right, and have made these like, beautiful parts, right? You can't argue with this, right? This is gorgeous. So those were the quality issues. Now, let's talk about things I'd call more design issues. Okay, for a design issue, the, the primary one I had was the bed isn't flat. Now, the glass is flat, right? That's not a problem. But the aluminum plate that the glass sits on top isn't flat. It's a thin plate. Uh, the way I w worked around those issues, first, uh, blue painter's tape, I had some rolls of that. And you can see, I think we've got a camera up here, so you can see a piece of painter's tape here piece of painter's tape here, piece of painter's tape here, that's off camera, piece of painter t painter's tape here. And that methodology was set the glass down, don't clamp anything, get a piece of paper, and start slipping on the edge. And you can see very easily where the paper's loose. Kind of estimate where it's loose, slip the glass back, put one layer of tape, put the glass back down. Kind of feel where it's loose. Back and forth, back and forth, till now where it's perfectly level. Well, it's not perfectly level, but at least it's flatter. And you're just going to count on the heat, the fact that it's not touching under this tape. The heat will get up through there, don't worry. Next, the clamping. I overclamped. They come with six of these little clamps. These guys, nothing's in focus, life's tough. Uh, and I put, you know, two in the front, two in this back and that. Then it occurred to me, three points to find a plane. So after that, I've gone to three clamps. And I kind of feel where it's solid. Uh, there's places like you know, here where they'll get pulled off if you leave them flipped back. So I have two clamps in front and one in back, and that seemed to improve things. Even though it still seems a little higher here, and then the, the trick there was, okay, flip the glass over, because the glass is bowed. I don't think so. I just think it's a little bow that when you apply these clamps, and you do need the clamps, when you apply these little clamps, it, it arcs the glass. And it doesn't have to be very many thousands before you can tell when you're trying to set up that critical first level. All right, next design issue I've got. The whole bed leveling mechanism. These little springs and sprongs. First off, it's putting compliance in the bed. So, and I'm trying to go fast. As you're moving, the whole bed can shake a little on those springs. Uh, my friend Dave, he's a smart guy, mechanical engineer. His method was to reef them down as hard as he could get, take all that spring out of it, and almost mount them hard. Then, make, you know, he trammed it. He's taught me about tramming. And then just try to release the one or two that you need to get it level. I couldn't quite get to that good a, a, a level. 
But I finally got it so once I trammed this, I could get this true and level the bed. There's an issue there. At first, the zero, you know, when you send it to home, the nozzle was going underneath the bed, even when I had it cranked down. They didn't make it quite clear that the, this home switch, you can loosen these three or four bolts here and, and pull that whole bracket up or down a little to adjust where this thing finds home. That should be a little more adjustable. I wish there was a design issue where you could adjust the home. It would make it easier to bring this thing down hard on the stops like it should be. Uh, the, the next design issue, well, that's the, the rollers are kind of, this is on rollers because all this is cheap stuff, right? Rollers on extrusions. It's not rails, it's not round rails, it's not uh, prismatic rails, but it's cheap. And you've got to believe for a thousand bucks, there's no way to improve this machine without spending a lot more money. Hundreds of dollars for rails. We'll get into that in a little bit. So the whole leveling mechanism a little Mickey Mouse. I'd also wonder if it could be set up with three screws, because three defines a plane, just like up here, and keep from you know, warping the bed as you try to adjust stuff with four screws. So that's a design issue. Next design issue, this whole spool, why they got to stick it out on an angle? For crying out loud, you know, this bracket doesn't have to be bent like this. Let me move my... Do they still make you bend? I'm sure they do. Why did they have to put that stylish rig? Just bring it straight up so you can keep the weight of this centered. Uh, you know, it's, it's no better going off this way. I don't know why they had to do that, but it would be nice if there was some way that they'd either give you a long enough cable to move this further away. The way it is now, I can get it right here, and you can see, oops, if I can get all of this spool back on. This works pretty good. I, I come off of the bottom. Well, you can't see it because of the U-band. All right. So I bring the spool off the bottom, come into the filament sensor, which I love, and then out here. Now, the spools have another problem, and this was all of them. The, the white, little white spool that came with the machine, that black spool I got from Stain Smart with the, the stuff that turned out to be unacceptable for me at least, and then this hatchbox stuff, when they start to spool and they're wrapping it up at the factory, they stick the PLA fil filament through a little hole in the hub here, right, and bend it and then turn the, turn the wheel and put all the thing on. Well, the, the little white one, the first one, I didn't know any better, that was a big enough hook and it was strong enough, it dragged this whole box over, yanked this whole thing, and then just jammed. Of course, now it's grinding here, and that's causing problems. And then just went empty for how, you know, an hour or whenever I checked on it. I said, oh my God, you know, I ran out of filament, but the filament sensor didn't work. And I, I could hear it working in the other room, so I just let it go. So that's a bit of a design issue. On all of these spools, I tried using a razor and cutting it. And it still leaves a tiny little hook, which also causes you a problem when that little hooked bit of PLA tries to go in the filament sensor. But I've learned, just wait until it's like one layer is left on the spool, get that thing out and snip it clean and, and just leave it wrapped up so that it's a perfectly clean end, no bent, no angle, no, no, none of that nonsense. So that way it runs through the filament sensor, the machine stops, you can hear it, you go deal with it. Deal with it quick. We're going to prove it out in a little bit. I got to make sure. I'm pretty sure when it runs out of filament, it turns off the heaters. That's tragic. First off, you want the heat on to yank the old filament out. But for me, it's really tragic because I didn't use any glue or any, any nonsense. Just plain glass. And you can see, yeah, you can see the, let's see the, upst the up upper camera. You can kind of see it glowing here. Look, look at that surface finish. It's like glass here. So. That was an issue. So I wish they'd improve those things. Okay, next design issue, the bed heater. See, I bought this big giant thing to make big giant things. The bed heater only goes out to about here and about here. It's smaller. So the heat is incredibly falls off as you go out towards the edge. You could get it here, 65 degrees, out here, 50, right? Actually, it was in the 40s. 
which meant I started getting delamination problems. We'll go over all that expertise in a, in a few seconds. So if the heater, they do sell heaters on Amazon, you name it, that are drilled for all the holes to make the heater full size. Unfortunately, those are 1300 watt heaters. The problem there is I bought the auxiliary heater thinking I want to do nylon. All that was a waste. The auxiliary heater has got the same problem because it's small, right? And it's got a separate control box. You plug it in the wall and just lie to the thing telling it that it's got, that you don't want heat or whatever, how you deal with that. But the problem with all those huge uh, wattage heaters that can get so hot so quick, trying to put this on an uninterruptible power supply, or I'm hoping to develop a battery backup system, a 12 volt lead acid battery, so that in the constant power failures we have out here in Florida, lightning strikes, whatnot, it'll carry it through and maybe work. And I don't want to supply a thousand watts to a heater. I want to supply this one. I put a, a watts up box on it, 265 watts total. That's with the, this heater going in the head. That's with the, this heater going on. That's the box itself. When it powers the bed heater off, it goes to about 50 watts. That I can back up with a battery for an hour or two easily. And I think that would be enough to get over the most power failure problems. Once again, the thing I'll remember, and it'll go right back where it was, but my problem is with this plain glass method I like to use and this beautiful surface finish, you lose bed heat. This thing just is so big and the shrinkage is so different. When it cools off, it, you just pick it up. There's no scraping this off the glass. So that's, that's an issue. I wish the bed heater was 500 millimeters by 500 instead of what it is now, 300. Probably the same one they use in their other machines, their smaller machines. That needs to be fixed. I think that's the most fixable, serious design issue. Make the he bed heater all the way to the edges, but don't make it 1300 watts. It's reality. Keep it the same 265 watts. So that's an issue, okay? Okay, now to the real problem, operator error. Right, newbie, looking at a lot of YouTube videos. Hopefully this will help somebody as well as all the ones that helped me. Uh, I guess the, the first problem I had was leveling. Because I have machinist buddies and they all use paper to set tool zero. So they bring the tool down and slide the paper and when the paper catches, that's one of the ways they say to do it. I think Creality tells you to do it that way. Do not do that. The, it's easy to feel, oh, okay, it's, it's just starting to scrape. But really what you're doing is you're pushing that bed down. And when that happens, it causes all kinds of problems. Let me see. Maybe the camera up above will catch this. This is some very thin pieces of the first layer. Yeah, it's kind of getting it. And you can see right here these thick sections. See how this is almost transparent? And I'm going crazy thinking, oh my gosh, I've got, I've got water in the PLA and it's boiling up except no hissing at the thing and no little wisps. But I figure, what else could account for this? Well, what accounted for this is, I, because I use that paper method, I had the bed way up high and pressing against the nozzle. And with this extruder, it'll squirt out, but after a while, it's got so much pressure, it, it squirts a whole bunch. And then once that happens, the nozzle goes over the hardened plastic here. Let's see if I can get that there hardened plastic here, and it lifts the nozzle up and even more squares. So it kind of turns into this auto-relieving too much pressure. Throw the paper away. If you don't have it, go get a set of feeler gauges, metric or English. I like English. And I started with 0.2 millimeters, which is the nominal layer thickness for what I was doing. With a feeler gauge, you can really get a feel for it. And as you get down sideways, you can actually see this picks up a little bit. And the bed, because of those stupid springs, it pushes down a little bit. And pretty soon, with a nice hard edge, you get that going. Also, turn the heat on. Get it preheated, because you don't want a little chunk of plastic fooling you, right? When it's heated up, even if there is a little bit of drizzle or plastic on the nozzle, you'll, you'll scrape off with this nice hard feeler gauge. Uh, some of the, now that I've figured out the right way to set bed level, there's, you can go 18, you know, 0 0.18, 0 0.18 millimeters, 0 0.15. 
0.10, that's using an English set. It actually, there's more choices as you go down to these thin layers. That made a huge difference and I could just tell the first time I did that, had the bed nice and level, went around a couple times. The, the way it laid down, they just looked perfect. I might have been up a little too high at 0.2, but okay, I'll go to 0.15 or something and get that first layer. But all of these came off of that. You know, that 0.2, it worked fine. And you could see the kind of surface finish I got. So it was still adequate. So operator error, not knowing how to level the bed, don't use paper, use a feeler gauge. You'll be happy. Okay, next operator error, that was speed. I was going slow and I was thinking I had steps and all these problems. I took a lot because I, I bought, oh, this is a tip for you, intermediate tip. I bought the Simplify 3D. Anytime you get a chance to give money to software people, give it. Because software is so complicated and so hard to do. Yeah, the, that, God, I can't remember the company. The, the, they give away their, their Cura software. It's open source. Everybody, oh, it's free, it's free, all the hobbyists love it. I'm an engineer. Give somebody 150 bucks and buy Simplify 3D. Simplify 3D did a little disservice to me because it set the speeds to 2400, aka 40 millimeters per second. That was a little slow, and of course the times were going to be uh, you know, over a week of, of time to do that big case. So I learned, even though I'm trying, I'm not making figurines like everybody else. I need precise engineering prototypes that I can make sure I don't have breakouts and that everything, the holes line up, all of that stuff. So for me, I wanted to push it, but not to the point where I was getting sk uh, skips in the stepper motors. Turned out 4,800, AKA 80 millimeters per second, worked out fine. So once I got the speed established, I'm kind of happy. I might go up a little, I might go down a little, but with the surface finish and we'll look at some of the parts afterwards, yeah, I'm happy with that. And the print times are quick, but they're reasonable. So all of my plans, this is another operator error. I want dual filaments. I want support structure and PVA that I can dissolve. I want all these other things not necessary, 80.8 millimeter filaments just squirt out a big thing. No, stock 0.4 millimeter nozzle, just what the machine came with. It's fine, I'm not gonna mess with it. It's doing a good job. It's doing what I need to do to prove all this stuff out before I carve it out of aluminum billet, which is really, really expensive. One of these big plastic pieces is about 20, 10, $20 in PLA, a very good bargain to be able to physically have what you need to see, all right? Okay, next big operator error, the bed heat. Simplify 3D, set it at 65. You can read on the side of some of the spools, that's within the range that PLA likes to be for, for bed heat kind of stuff. 65 is fine, but what you don't realize, the thermocouple or the, the thermistor in the bed heater is reading at the bed heater. It's not reading the top of the glass. Fortunately, I've got a fluke multimeter and, uh, if I can reach it, this fluke uh, infrared reader. And since everything's black and even the blue tape, that's when I learned setting at 65, the middle of the bed was 55 and it was well under 40 here. That was causing problems like uh, it wasn't sticking, it was curling up warping at, at the ends. That could have been also my fast speed, right? The faster you go, the hotter the, the PLA is for a longer stretch. So when it cools, I think it might create a, a lifting force. But once I bumped, all I had to do is go into simplifier. You can override it. The controller lets you override all this. Bump it up to 75 and then wait. Be really patient. When you walk up to the machine, you're getting ready to do a print. First thing you do, set it to 75. Because while you fiddle around and tram this and all that, you're given plenty of time, not for the thermostat to read 75, that'll happen pretty quick, but you gotta get thermal equilibrium. You gotta let that heat slowly creep out to the edges. And that's what you want before you start the print. So with this, I learned, no, set that to 75. And even though the bed heater should be physically bigger, it should run out to the edges of the bed itself. That's okay, I can live with it. Uh, next, design project might be 
one of those 1300 watt bed heaters, but run it with a diode in series or something to cut it down so it's a 600 watt bed heater or something smaller that uh, won't be such a problem to uninterruptible power supply or battery backup. So that was an issue. Okay, next operator errors. Some say it's an older thing to spray hairspray or glue stick or Elmer's glue in water, and that's how you get it to stick. And of course, I'm, I'm lifting, I'll show you one in a little bit. I'm lifting up at the corners when I'm way away from the bed heat before I figure it up, just crank that bed heat up to 75. So, oh, and also there was an issue with that same crappy PLA, where's the picture? That stuff, that seemed to be part of the problem too, because Hatchbox, of course, by then it was one of those double variables. Sorry, folks. I not only turned up the bed heat, I switched to this Hatchbox, love Amazon. So that could have been the issue. But I, I never wanted hairspray, because I said hairspray goes everywhere, it's going to be in everything, it's going to be a mess. It's just physically. I was against Elmer's glue, but I had some the night I was having all these problems, so I mixed up some and spread it. Instantly you could tell, it's not a controlled process. It really takes a skill to get it so level. And I was like, oh, okay. Because there's a guy on the internet, you know, on YouTube, who's like, oh, you don't need any heat. Do it my way with glue sticks. So I went and bought three different brands of glue sticks. And I did it this way, and I did it that way. And I got the sponge with water and dabbled it like he did. You could tell instantly from the first time it started to print something. It's like, this is not uniform. The first layer is a mess because it's not uniform. Maybe I didn't dabble it just right. But it's that same problem. You don't want all this skill involved in an analog kind of thing to be dependent on if the print works or not, right? Life's too short. So I went back to glass. That's when I figured out to turn up the heat. Got the good Hatchbox PLA here, at least acceptable. I don't know if it's the best or not. We can argue. Uh, and after doing that, then I started getting on plain glass. And like I say, when it cools off, there's no prying or that. It just picks right up. Some of that might be because of these warping forces. I'll show you these cases. The, the more hollow one, the narrower, hollower one, is actually the entire thing is warped. It didn't lift a little and ruin itself, like, like uh, I'll show you with the other PLA. But it's still a little warped. But it clamps up. It, it's, it's flexible enough. Part of this is because part of my speed demon, I want these to be quick because I'm learning. I know I was going to find a lot of mistakes, which I did. That was 0 0.1, 10%, 10% infill, which is a very light infill. Does that make the warping worse, better uh, accuracy? I don't know. All that's for the future. But that taught me a lot of buy the machine, start making stuff, and then deal with problems as opposed to theorizing all the problems you'll have that you'll want dual extruders and, yo, oh, I didn't like Borden tubes. <laughs> it works fine. Look at, look at this four straight days working without fault, accurate. I'll show you a piece I made for this transmission jig that I built where it's, it's got a plate with a, with a hollow in it and a small plate that fits into it. I printed them both. I didn't figure in a million years they'd actually fit. I figured I'd have to sand and mess. Just perfect with the 5,000 uh, tolerance that I put in there, slop that I intentionally put in in SolidWorks, perfect. So everything it needed to do, it did. Okay, so that, I don't know that I have any other issues here. Bed heat, speed, leveling, glue, glue guns. Yeah, keep all of that stuff out. Uh, the procedure, like I say, I walk up to the machine, had to have this, walk up to the machine, turn on the heat, first thing. Then, after you get this trammed, whether you use these parallels like I did, however, however you get this bar, flat to the base, then adjust this. Like I say, you may have to go over here and loosen this home switch plate, the whole plate. You can't adjust the home switch itself. You might be able to bend that little lever on the switch. I hate doing that because that's once again, you made a custom part out of a standard part. I'd rather adjust the plate where it's supposed to be than if that switch gets crunched or something, I can go in and, and just replace the switch and it'll be about in the same spot. So tram everything true. <clears throat> Flattening the bed, all that was critical. Uh, setting the nozzle heat to 210, I think. I just, whatever uh, Simplify 3D recommended, I just went with it. 
I think it's 210 degrees centigrade. Turn that on so, as well, but not right away, you know, while you're tramming. That comes up quick. It's real time. There's no thermal mass to kind of creep out and warm. So it's almost instantaneous. Whatever it reads, it's pretty much what the nozzle is already. So when that gets to 210, then do the auto leveling. Real careful. That same principle my buddy Dave taught about. Try to have it down on the springs. If you can mess with that home switch and that, because that's just making everything stiffer. As it moves, there'll be less vibrations and those little wiggles you can see in all of these prints. So that's that. I'm having good luck. I'm happy. I'm patient. It's the kind of thing, if I was a fast turn design shop, I had customers, I'd just make it stuff and bill it and pay the money because you're making big money and it's time to market and all of that. But if you time things out, so you're messing with one thing while the other's printing and then you go around, it can kind of work out and it saves a fortune. And it's, there is nothing, no matter how much CAD and showing it on the screen and other people, if you give them something physical, everybody understands that. So that's a benefit. Other than that, what? Well, how to improve this machine. Now, I hope those criticisms of the little quality issues and stuff doesn't turn you off of this machine. You gotta realize how brilliant this is. I always maintained a Chevy Chevette has better engineering than a Corvette because the Chevette engineers had no money. So these roller things on extrusions, what are you gonna do? Uh, okay, I want this to be more true. Well, now you gotta go to, uh, steel rails, either rods like the Core XY machines do, or a steel rail for the bed problem. If I, if I tear into this, and I might do this as a fun project for us all, let's see if I can put rails here instead of these extrusions and those rollers that weep the little junk out. As soon as you do that, you're, if you get high wind rails, who would have thought Taiwan stuff is the good stuff now? Thompson really invented the rails, SKF makes them too. But however you get, there's good rails that cost hundreds of dollars. The Taiwan rails, well, $12, 15, 60. I'm not, not the Taiwan, the Chinese, the red Chinese rails. They're scrapey, they're junky. I don't know if it's worth a mess. I wouldn't do that. I'd at least pay for high winds. So, okay, so you put the rails in, you, you take these extrusions out. Uh, you, can you see them from up above? Maybe if I pull this back. So take this out and this out. Put in a steel rail. Keep the same bed. Life's good. Then you run a problem of this, this bed. The rollers are having the center so that you can get the full travel. When it, let's see, I don't want to bang this too hard. It, it overhangs the front quite a bit as it's getting its full travel. And don't go too fast. It'll light that thing up. It overhangs the back. When it, oh, I heard the limit switch click. So in theory, right, you want the support for this bed to be out at the four corners. That minimizes any angular uh, problem compared to any inaccuracies in, in the carriages. Well, to do that, these rods, let's go back here and here, they'd have to stick way out in front and they'd have to stick way out in back. That's kind of a pain, although it could be a benefit because the first time I ran this thing, I banged the bed into the back wall and it's like, oops, had it a little too close. Uh, another little tip, I was on a card table moving around, so I clamped that card table. You don't want this on a flimsy thing because that just control theory doesn't like it when there's movement and accelerations from vibrations and, and just shaking as well as trying to control the steps and whatnot. So that, that was uh, something I just fixed clamping. So what else? Um, you put the rails in. Haas machines, good old Gene Haas, made in the USA, you don't level a Haas milling machine every time you use it. It's level. It's a piece of machinery. I'd like a tool like that. I'd like a 3D printer that you don't level because it's just level. Everything's accurate enough. You true it up once when you build it, and it stays true for the entire life of the machine. A Haas and what would you have to do? You'd have to wear the beds out and the ball screws in a Haas before you started having some kind of leveling problems. So I'd like to see some place with rails. So that, that solves that. And then I would think ditch the aluminum, go to a thick piece of glass, mount it on the carriages the, uh, out in the corners, and that might be a good solution. Uh, there's this brilliant guy, Salander, I think it is, 
I forget his YouTube channel, sorry. He did an experiment with a heat gun. Oh, he had a FLIR camera. So he looked at all of the different bed heaters. He did one that was silicone mounted directly to glass. That was the only little mistake he made, because glass is transparent. So he wasn't really looking at the heat of the surface of the glass. He was looking at the heat of that silicone pad, because the FLIR camera will see right through the clear glass. To understand how the heat is distributed on the glass itself, on the top where it matters, you'd have to either spray paint the glass black, so it's no longer transparent and it radiates the heat, or you could probably just put this blue painter's tape everywhere and it would all thermally get to the right thing and then see. I think if the glass is thick enough and you can't make it too thick, this is where you get to the brilliance of this design. It's just enough for what it has to do at a ridiculously cheap price point. As soon as you go to linear rails, well, that's weight, but it's not moving weight, the rail, but the carriage. So if you go to a big rail, now you've got a big carriage, and that's moving. So now what? You make the stepper motor bigger, it just starts running away from you. So one of the things, when I look at completely different architectures, the core XY machines, where they move the head in XY with this clever core XY uh, mechanism that moves around, and then the bed is just on ball screws and you lower it down. As, as you build. That way the size of the machine is equivalent. There's no overhang here. There's one called rail core that I really like because they use rails on the top for the, the travel and that seems like a really smart way to get the most accurate, like milling machine accuracy and stiffness, which is all going to give you better surface finishes. And for me, if you could set it up so you don't have to level it every time. There's all these guys that are doing where it measures the level, I don't like that. Just like this should be true to the machine base, this should be true to that. And if you're adjusting, that means the control software is constantly raising a couple, of, you know, tenths of a millimeter, lowering a couple, and you're not building a flat surface anymore. You're actually, you know, putting curves in that surface. That's Mickey Mouse, right? A piece of glass is optically flat, so it's a good place to start. Uh, how, how to hack on this to, to keep the weight down? Well, that'd be a real tricky thing. And maybe we'll look at that, you know, if I get, if I get bored one day and want to do a little machine design. How to increase, how to put in rails that are small enough that don't increase too much weight. How to figure out how to support the glass firmly, set everything up once, it's true. Uh, maybe limit switches on both here and here. Now you're into new control software and probably a new control board because the little Marlin board, the open source board in here is almost full. It doesn't have that much more memory to have two homes and to do all that. So it, it runs away from you. You know, like I say, this is a brilliant design. It does just what it has to do at the price that it does. So that's it for the machine. That's what I've learned so far. Any more updates, I'll come show you. The other thing I want to do, I'll show off some of these parts so you understand how cool this thing is. And uh, before that, while it's still set up here in the studio, I'll fire this box up and we'll test a couple of problems that I had where I think it, it didn't run out of filament. I think I said stop print. So, okay. And then I went to control the axis and bring it back. Bang, bang, bang. It, it hit hard stop. It's like, what happened to limits? Somehow it forgot the limits because of the way I ended it. Either I paused it or I ended the print and then you have to realize if that's true, we'll find out in a minute. Well, then you have to be sure to home next so it knows where it is and then do any kind of stuff. Now, when I had the filament run out and did a resume print, it did fine. It, 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 it knew where it was. It remembered its location. It's remembered its home. It went, went to the corner then went right back and continued. Magnificent, especially if you're doing these giant parts like I was. What I did do wrong tip for you, when I rethreaded, you know, leave the heater on, you might have to go, they turn the heat off too indiscriminately. That's the one firmware problem I've got. Leave the bed heat on always. You know, turn the machine off if you don't want bed heat. They turn the bed heat off, so turn the bed heat back on immediately by manual control. Turn the heater on, because when you pull this little piece out, you know, you want the heater on, you get, pull that out. When I fed the new filament in, I forgot to feed it through 
filament out sensor. That was laying out, out here in the back. And I missed for five minutes. Why doesn't it? It just flashes once. It's not, it's not restarting. Oh my God, the, this big giant print, four days, it's halfway built. Turns out, I forget what it was that, that made me realize the way it was acting. It, it acts like, it kept saying, out of filament, out of filament. Well, it's not out of, oh wait. If you don't run the filament through the sensor, it's out of filament as far as the machine's concerned. Same thing, had the heat on, yanked it out, put the filament sensor in, threaded it through all of that. And that, people complain about this filament sensor that it's a little Mickey Mouse because it just kind of presses on. I kind of like that because it makes it easier to refeed. It, everything is just enough. You know, you could drill it in or hinge it or do fancy stuff, but this is a, a real achievement in machine design. To, they, something for a thousand bucks can make these giant parts. So let's go, first we'll go and test. Does this thing really lose its place on a pause or an end or a stop? And from there, we'll just bring some show and tell to show you the way this thing printed, okay? See you in a bit. So what, the way I've developed the thing, turn the box on, you can hear it running. First thing, Press this, goes down to control, temperature, set the bed temperature to 75. Uh, 76. Well, this is part of being OCD. I said 75, and I keep turning it. Ah, okay. So now the bed's starting to heat already. Now the very next thing, now while that's starting to equalize, you can get to prepare auto home. First thing you want to do. Thing will go find its home. Hopefully I got all the limit switches hooked when I moved it into the studio. Finds Y. Now it's going down in Z. Happy. Now, uh, let's see, move axis. Move axis, move a millimeter, move X, get that out of the way. See, I hit this clamp. Not a good thing. Should have moved up in, should have moved up in uh, Z first. The amount of times I banged into these clamps one way or the other. All right, so now I have these parallels. Oops, see, I skipped some steps. Don't do this. Don't do it this way. Here, see that looseness? Can you hear it? I don't think this is part of it. It's not on camera, but trust me. Maybe we can show it. There, now you can see. Life is good. So this one is really loose. This one is barely loose. So go back down, go move 0.1 millimeters. Move Z. You can feel when it's down. Now let's go over here and see. Ah, it stayed right that little bit. Now, here's a really Mickey Mouse way to do it. You just run it down. It'll skip steps on this one where it's blocked, and this one will come down as well. I don't advise that. Instead, let's try doing it the right way. Prepare. Disable steppers. You even hear a little dink. Then, hopefully this one's down, go to this ball screw. I'm reaching around, getting the ball screw. Oh, I went up, down. There, nice and down. This one, nice and down. Everything, this is now true to this. Then go move axis. We gotta turn the steppers back on. Move axis, 
uh, one millimeter, and don't, just turn, moving any axis will turn the steppers on. Move X, okay, good. Now move a tenth of a millimeter, move axis Z, and now you gotta remember, I should pull these out, but I kinda remember going clockwise is up. Uh, it didn't work. It's a little tight here, it's a little loose here. So, let's go up. Do the other trick where you just run it down. Now come down. Just a little, ooh. Not perfect, but flat enough. So now, the, now this is trammed. You've made this bar level with this. Now let's go to the next thing. You want to auto bed level. Go here, here, uh, prepare, auto bed leveling. I've got this set at 18.18 millimeters at seven thousandths of an inch. This is an English, uh, this is an English uh, feeler gauge set. So let's see what we can do here. Auto bed leveling. Oh, before you do that, I'm sorry. Before you do that, main, control, temperature, nozzle, run that up to 210. Doesn't have to be exactly 210, but somewhere in the vicinity. And main, and the info screen, you can watch. See, now, the info screen shows it's set it's set at 75. The measured temperature is 54. It's, I love this screen, too. I mean, it's very intuitive for me, at least. This says I just set this 210 here, and the nozzle is up already at 82. So that's good. We're happy. Give it some time. What we can do in the meantime, no, we don't want to control. We want to prepare. I can never remember what they put in what menu. It's like AutoCAD. Move axis. Let me move 10. Y. Get this forward a little bit. I kind of like that there. So, prepare, main, info screen, info screen, 210, 158, 75, 55. See, this is why you turn the heater on so early in this whole procedure. Here's an interesting thing. Can you see this? Twenty six degrees, which makes sense. You put your hand there, yeah, it's warmer. So this says we're at fifty six degrees. Let's go here. See a good ten degrees colder than what the thermos couple or what the thermistor reads. Out here at the edge, another ten, thirty one. Right? Fifteen more degrees. So that's what the big success for me having to have this equipment. You got to set this heater if you want it at 65, which to me was seemed like reasonable. You set this at 75. I could tell as I, I use my little watt, watts a lot. Can I bring that around? Oh, how cool! So here's a little watts a lot. It's showing. It's just all both heaters are full blown on. So here we are, 273 watts. That's how much this baby's taken. So let's set that here. Maybe you can see it. Okay, so it's dropped down uh, some wattage because the heater in the nozzle has reached temperature. So we'll, we'll keep an eye on this, but now that the nozzle's warm enough, you can press, prepare, bed auto leveling, next step. Need some of this to get the filament stuff off. Make sure that's good and clean. I can still see some filament leaking out. That's just natural pressure that's built up from being moved around, no crisis. And then with the feeler gauge, let's 
see a little piece of plastic came off. You can see that right there? Little piece of plastic. So that's, ooh. This is the other reason you really want to do this slowly enough so that the bed gets at its final temperature. So you got the nozzle at temperature, the bed at temperature. That's when you not want to auto level. Not when the nozzle's cold and there's a chunk of plastic on it. Not when the bed's cold and it's not got its thermal final resting spot. So we might as well just go through it, show you. This should be not a lot of news to people. Comes down. Don't set it too tight like I did. That's way. Uh, in fact, this is far enough, enough. I think we can loosen this. Hear it? You can hear it, and you can feel it. When you get it right, as you look down to the side, oh, see, there's a bunch of plastic there, too. And, and just see the pressure, my, it's like a doctor, just a tiny, because this is a very loose one. This thing was always down low, so the spring's all the way up. The tiniest pressure put in here, can you see it? Maybe if you could see it, how can I do that? So you can, you can just see the tiniest bit of pressure moves that. That's why without touching it, come from this side, Okay, there was a bit of plastic that deduced out. That's okay. And one of the things I've looked for, when it's really too tight, you can see the bed move down, and you can see this head move up a little. When you get it right, it goes under, and it's a feel thing. You just keep going around and around. Next step. Okay, it's again a little loose. So bring that up. Ah, see? God, I wish you could see it. When you're here in the flesh, you can actually see, you get a feel for it. Oh, that's pretty close. That's pretty close. And this is just the first time around, right? You're going to do this a lot. This, this. That's the other quality problem I forgot to mention. This fan is loose. See, that's too tight. So that's this bow that I've got. You can, I don't know if you can see it, but it really hops up. Right, watch. You see the whole thing drop down a little. I flipped the glass. That's just this bed isn't level. The, the aluminum. I don't know how to fix it. Maybe maybe tape around all the edges and get the whole thing, you know, put one row of tape around the whole thing and lift it up one complete thing. Maybe that'll get it flat because glass is optically flat. Next step, here. So I'm going to go around again. I'll stop the cameras and uh, go around one more time and try to get this trued up. But you just do it a couple times. See, the bed's still only at 64. So I'm going to go through this a couple of times. All right, so I went around a couple more times. The bed's still at 68, so it's, it's, it takes a while, air-conditioned house. It's going to take a while for that bed to get up to, to 75. So we're going to wait a little bit more. It's trued up, and the thing to look for, do I have this kind of problem where it's building up pressure and squirting out? like this did. I, forget, I think it's the big case uh, G-code that's still in here in the little disk. So I'll be back when that bed heats up. It's taking its time. Okay, we're back. Now what we've done, it's to, to get up to 75 takes a lot longer than to get up to 65, but I still prefer the low power heater, 254 watts. 
I put some paper towels very lightly. Don't touch the bed because you'll screw up your auto level. Uh, just as insulation, so it's coming up to temperature. Next thing, prepare, move axis, move a millimeter, move Z, come up a little bit. And move a millimeter, move X, oops, wrong way. I like to get here where I can see it, next to the control box. Move a millimeter, move Y. Uh, move it back here. And prepare. Uh, I am not sure. Preheat, cool down. No, we don't want to do any of that. Is it move axis? One millimeter? Oh, yeah, extruder. Now I like to run the extruder just a little bit. Set temperature. I asked for 30 millimeters, that's an inch. And because it's been sitting and, and that PLA is probably bad, I like to run about an inch through it. So take one of these. We're probably up to 75 degrees. Very okay, now you see it's squirting real nice. Oh, that's a happy day. Then get this kind of junk. Get that get that nozzle nice and polished. What's interesting is the pulleys aren't moving anymore. See how much junk I'm getting off of there? That's why I like to get it up in the air a little bit. Same thing, don't bang on that bed, you're gonna screw up your leveling. Same thing here, you want to be pretty delicate. Look at it again. Okay. So now we can get this off of here. Ouch, don't screw up. I felt something there. Boy, the bed is nice and hot. Next tool, there's a little dink from that auto level. Little razor blade. Ah, hear it? That came off. Same thing, it's now is not the time to scrub it clean because that'll mess up the level, the springiness. That's the sponginess. So we still got a little coming out of the extruder. And now prepare main print from SD. Right case G code. Here we go. Oh, it changed the bed heat. Uh, tune, bed, send it back up to 75. Uh, for some reason, I just keep hitting 76. There we go. So now we should look, yep, there's a nice bead coming out. It's thick and black. Now it's gonna go do the case. Off it goes. Hopefully you hear this rattle here that shows the problem, but I can see a nice bead. This is at 0 0.18. That's what the uh, feeler gauge was set to. Over and over, I was bringing it down too far. I, I, same thing, I don't do ramps and I don't do skirts either. I would use a skirt on the part if it kept bending up, and they do bend up a little. When we show them off to you in a minute, you'll see that. But nice uniform, nice dark black. Before, I was way down too low because I was using paper. And you think it's like, oh, it's barely touching. I feel the lightest amount of scraping. But this springy bed and the compliance and looseness in this, the, the art of auto leveling is partially because Everything's so spongy. See here, you can kind of see, here's a little trial squirt it does before it goes. Now it's making the part itself. That was the, I don't think it's called a skirt. It, it, it's the little surround thing. And that gives you a good idea. See, that's talking to you. I mean, even from here, as I've done enough, I can say, oh, that's in pretty good shape. It's two widths of, of PLA uh, passes. Now it's doing the actual part. That's four millimeters in or five mil, I forget. 
And this was my other thing, because the way uh, Simplify 3D set it up, they started at 2400, same as 40 uh, millimeters per second. I double that, but when you do that, be sure to go in the settings and half the first layer speed, because I thought the first layer speed, they had it at 50% of 40, in other words, 20. I wanted it to be back at that 20, so that when I double the speed to 80 millimeters per second, I did a 25% first layer speed. And going slow, I think, is just always a good thing. Might be hard for you to see. Oh, it's a pretty good, pretty good image. But just that first pass around, this is the engine case. Let's see if I can go get it for you. Well, I think this is the right half. While it's printing, this is this one. It is sitting like that. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Like I said, it's not dead flat, but it pulls flat against the other piece. We'll show you that when we start showing some of the parts. Now, everything seems to be at temperature. It says 70. There, it went to 47 watts. 91 watts, 273 watts, 261 watts, 260, 260, 258, 259, 260, 259, 258, 257, 258, 256, 259. It's going to make a liar out of me because we should see it collapse down to that 50. Of course, as it's moving, it's cooling off, just like being in the wind. So I see its t measured temperatures drop down to 74. So this is going to stay on there. It went up to 75. Boom. This went down. Now, when I did the math, when it was, see, n no air conditioning should blow on it. I closed the room, blocked the air conditioning vents. I noticed at 70, at, at set for 75, it seems to be a 25% off cycle. So it's on 75% of the time. Then it goes to the low power for 25% of the time, which means it could be set higher. I mean, I guess you could send it to 200 degrees and it would just always be on, but then you've lost process control, right? Then it depends on the temperature of the room and other variables. So you want it to be in control. So now it's pretty happy. I'll let it do this second, second layer around. And now we're going to see if this thing loses its place. Pause print. Okay. Pause brings it back to home. I may screw that up too. No, it missed. Just lucky. Just lucky. Now let's go up to the info screen. See, it's zeroed out both temperatures. That's horrible. That, that's criminally bad. So resume print. Now we've got to go up to the info screen and wait for it to come up five degrees. Just the tiniest bit of off time really collapses the temperatures. At least it's set back, 75 and 250. I think the problem when I crash the machine, which is a serious thing, any machinist will tell you that, when I crashed the machine was because I stopped the print. And it seemed to forget where it was, so that when I used move axis, it allowed me to slam it back into, into X. We'll test that theory next. But uh, for now, I'm going to turn it off. It's going to take a while to get back to temperature and uh, start. As soon as it gets to 75, I'll turn it back on, and we can see. OK. I'm going to hit, see, I hit the clip because, oh, this is a serious screw up, isn't it? Oh, life is never good, is it? So that's an issue when you do a pause. But it seems to be going back to where it was. Slowly, I'll admit. Let's see if it picks it right back up. I don't see the extruder moving yet. Yeah, and now the extruder is going. So it, it picked it up. Okay, so that's test one firmware. 
Let's pause it again. Pause, print. Now it's not going back to zeros. Oh, now, now finally. Oh, yeah, finally it's going back. You got to wonder about this. And it's going back here. It went to zero. So now we're going to say, let's do this. Prepare, move axis. Let's move the z axis up a little. And let's tell it resume print. We'll see if it mixes this thing. Of course, it's going to take forever because it's down to 152 and 66 again. I'll pause until it warms back up, okay? Hang on. Okay, it woke up. It stayed up in the air. It's doing it's doing Y and Z. It went straight off this way, so it didn't bang into the clamp. Of course, it's up now. Let's see if it drops down to Z again. Does it resume in Z? Here's the question. It's still up. There's a bunch of... No. See, so because I messed with the Z, now it's in the middle of the air. That's not too good. So remember, don't mess with Z. It's just squirting up in the air. Pause, print. Resume print. Let's go right back where we were. I'll be back in a minute. Okay, so it woke up, it got back up to temperature. Let's see if it kicks down to 65 like when we started. I don't think so because the temperature settings are at the beginning of the G code. So if you, if you this G code happened to set it, reset it at 65 degree bed temperature. So now it's going, yeah, it's printing up in the air, just squirting stuff out. Now let's do what I did last time. Let's get about in the middle where it was last time I remembered. Oh, come on. Never. I like the sound it makes. And now let's say stop print. Okay, so it stopped. Now, let's go to prepare. Let's go to move axis. Move one millimeter, move X. Okay, it says 198. That's about where it is. Can I? Oh, yeah, see. Somehow the inaccuracies have added up that it is still skipping steps over here. So that's must, it didn't completely forget where it was. It said 198. Of course, once you've done that, that's it, baby. You can start reprinting, but that's that. So that crash that I thought was because it forgot where it was, it didn't. It's just got some inaccuracy that when it comes back, it's banging hard into this limit switch, which is a never good thing. So when you do stop a print, let's see uh, how would we do this. Print from SD card. Let's do this. Uh, right case G code. Heating. Okay, I'm going to pause while this thing heats back up. Oh, and it's only set at 60. Oh, it'll start going right away. One of the things I did that may be stupid is I took out the first command of the G code, which was to home. Because I said, well, I don't want to rehome because that's an inaccuracy. So let's see. I assume it wouldn't be, see, that's the crash. Running the G-code again, somehow this thing has got some error or some offset. So that replicated the crash. 
it is back on the bed, it is doing its thing because it skips steps, you know. Okay, so let's, what did I want to do? Stop print, okay? So now we've stopped the print. Notice that it crashed. That's a horrible thing. So, okay, I started over. I auto-homed. I said, run the, the G code because we've learned it will crash. You stop it and then go to restart. That may have been how I crashed it. So it's doing its thing. And let's stop print like before. And rather than, you know, rerunning it or whatnot, you need to go to prepare, see if this thing's smart enough. Well, what you probably should do is move axis one millimeter, get this thing up a little bit, bring it up so it just doesn't hit those clamps. Prepare, and before restarting or anything, you stopped it. It's lost its place pretty much. You didn't pause it. So then tell it to auto home and it doesn't bang like it did before. Okay? Good. So that's a little tip. Uh, with the filament sensor out, to me, the big problem there was it turns all the temperatures off. So as you're sitting there waiting and it runs out of filament or maybe you pull the last couple inches off, immediately go into control and set the temperature. I think it lets you, if it's not there, you're in the middle of the thing, it's the tune. Maybe it lets you get at the tune menu and go turn the heaters back on. You don't want that bed to cool down while you're fiddling with, with things that might pop, the, uh, might pop the part off. So that's the, the printing tips, okay? Let's uh, quiet things down. People have said, oh, you should let it cool off, cool down. I don't know what that means. When I watch it and you tell it to cool down, it just turns the stuff off. I don't see any retractions. I don't see anything change. So those are my tips for printing itself. I'll carry all this back where it was and show you some of the parts that I've made, like this uh, engine case. All right? Catch you in a little bit. Hi, Paul again. Now we're going to talk about what the Creality CR10 S S5 500 millimeter by 500 millimeter 3D printer did for me. I'm redesigning a Harley Sportster engine case for the old ones, the old iron Sportsters back in the 70s. Part of it is closing up the uh, transmission to the crankcase. And they had a big shift mechanism here that I needed to get rid of and redesign. So I wanted to make this jig here. We'll pull this clutch basket off. Put that over here. So looking from the camera above, looking down, you can see these are the gears for the early, you know, 1952 to 1990. I think Sportsters used this four-speed gearbox. And I needed to figure out a way to make this plate. See, it's, it's, it can actually shift. So 3D printed this, 3D printed this, 3D printed this. Now, ultimately, I'll probably want to make these in aluminum. But I wanted to be sure, and I found a lot of mistakes that I made and problems, even though it was 3D SolidWorks CAD, high zoot stuff, it's still things that I missed. So that alone, just having this jig, the $1,000 for the printer, I'm happy, right? It's a lot of money, but for, to make something this big, because of that heater problem, here's the extra heater you can buy. I spent an extra 100 for this or 150. Big mistake, because it's a 1,000 watt heater. I don't really need a 1,000 watt heater. I need a heater that covers the entire bed. Fortunately, the stock heater and even this one would be big enough to print these parts. But this is what impressed me so much at the beginning is that this circular plate rotates and that's what shifts the forks. I printed the outside part, printed the inside figuring, oh, I'll have to sand or grind or it'll be sloppy. It fits with about the 5,000th clearance that I designed in, in SolidWorks. So this is a great thing, right? Pull that off. You can see the shift forks that do the work here. So this, you know, this base piece, the side pieces, this little piece, this piece. I forget, uh, I think it was a day, like this piece is pretty complicated. One of the things this piece here does, let's see if we can turn it a little bit. It, um, 
it positions the electric start. So when that, when that clutch is on it here, it verified that I'd measured correctly on the old cases, the distance from the electric start to the clutch basket here. So it, it proved that out. It's going to prove out a, lot of, a bunch of other things and helping me Im improve those th things. Uh, I had to do it over. I had to set the thicknesses. Like you're allowed to select how much infill. I did 10% because I was in a hurry. But I only did, I think, three layers of solid on the outside edges and inside holes. I'd now do at least four, maybe even five or six. So there's a lot of meat there, like when I thread things. So that was the first lesson, and I'm, this alone paid for the printer in my, in my mind. I really wanted this thing to, to get proven out before I start cutting aluminum and spending big money having billet parts made. So first project, you know, after the silly stuff, after working up to it and all the mistakes I found that I talked about in the other video. So happiness here, now on to a bigger job. I was so excited by this. Let me show you what I printed next. Okay, the transmission jig to figure out my shift mechanism. That went so well, I said, well, let's print the case halves themselves. Because this is a complete case redesign. So this is the first print I started. It went wrong pretty early on. I mean, this is still, I don't know, a day or so, this much thickness. And you can see the problem, the warping here. Now, if it warped after I pulled it off, after it cooled off, uh, like the other half did, I'll show you that in a minute, that's one problem. But this started warping as it printed. So this corner right here, see, see how much gap there is right there? Not cool, can I show it, show it this way, how much? How much is out? Yeah, maybe that, that'll help you kind of visualize how, oops, wrong way, how far up this thing, and now it's, it's warped even more once it cooled off and came off the plate. But since this is bending up as you go, it's completely ruined because now, you, you know, you're just printing up in the air here and there's this big gap and nothing is true enough. Even after I figured things out, my stuff lifts a little at the sharp corners, but this had two problems. That cheap PLA that I bought through Sane Smart. there's a picture, I'll put it over there maybe. There's a picture, don't buy this stuff because I'm sure that was part of it. Now you can see there's a difference here. This, I ran out of that stuff and started the new stuff and then noticed how much warping I was getting, aborted the whole print. By then I had the Hatchbox PLA that I got from uh, from Amazon, and they brag it's 0.03% more accurate instead of 0.05, maybe. I started this one, this is the infill that, you know, where there's gonna be a hollow spot, so don't worry about that. That's on purpose, that it's all broken out. Here again, can you see it? It started lifting again. Here, let's put it here. So it started lifting again. Not nearly as bad, it was much less severe, but, you know, I was getting excited enough by all this Let's figure out what we can do. That's when I realized that even though Simplify 3D had set the bed temperature at 65, in the Creality CR10S S5, when the bed thermistor measures 65, the bed itself is 55, and then out on the edges, it's under 40. So that of course, because this is such a big thing, it's right at the corners of that bed. I had to put it, this won't go straight in the Creality, it has to go diagonally. That's how big this is in the 500 by 500. I'd say the, the corner was right about here on this thing. So it's cooler down there. So then I realized, turned the bed temperature up to 75, aborted these, then I printed the real thing. Let me show you that, I'll be right back. Okay, after these couple failed attempts, turned the bed heat up to 75 degrees, and I got this guy out. And this is, I've got a starter motor mounted on it, but I mean, look at this thing, it's gorgeous. Printed it from this side, and if I hold it right, you can, look at this, it's like glass smooth here. That's how good the bed did. Once I figured out, don't level it with a piece of paper, level it with a feeler gauge. This one I think is 0.2. 0.2 millimeters, yeah, I believe, you know, the nominal layer thickness. So it, it adhered well. When it cooled off, it just 
picked up. I mean, I didn't have to scrape it or that, which can be a problem. That means if you lose bed heat, something goes wrong or you pause it and forget to turn the heater back on manually, the thing will pop off and then you lose that. This one had a, a filament change, I forget where, on the second hatch box, I think maybe here. All that went well, you know, running out of filament. That went great. Where else can you do this? Yeah, it was $1,000. I'm sure this is five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 just to have this made out of billet. It's well worth it to me to do that. More importantly, what paid off, there's a feature here you can see. One of the things that's different about this is than a regular Harley Sportster in the old days, is that there's an oil reservoir back here and there's an oil reservoir up here. And to connect the two, I hated doing this. I ran a thin little machine channel here. And I hate doing that because that's the bottom of the case. That's where it might leak. You got hot oil running this whole thing. Look at how thin these sections are. And I knew I wasn't going to like it, but it hadn't even built up there to convince me that this was bad engineering. What was going on, it was, it was printing in, in this direction, right? This is the last part of the print. So it was sitting down like this in the printer, and it was doing one of the lower sections, right? It's going up and it takes, I think this took over four days to print. And I'd go and look, and I noticed there was a solid block of aluminum that goes down here all the way through this, all the way through this transmission underneath the counter shaft hole here. So down here. And if I could get a gun drill, which drills straight, and maybe come in from the back here, I'd have to cut a needless hole here in this back wall, then I could go through and make a nice big, maybe not half inch, but darn large three eighths easy all the way and connect them that way. Then I could solid this up. Oh my gosh. I loved it, right? The 3D printer paid off just watching it work, right? It's, it's fun to see it build up. So that paid off. So that was the next part, four days. Then I printed this part. So this is the other case half. It goes like this. Uh, you can see, oh God, there's almost an eighth of an inch here. This is warped. It stayed on the bed, but then after it cooled off, it sproinged a little. The, the non-serious thing is you can pull it back true. So I've got the bolts and I'll do that. So when I bolt it up, it will be true again. How to fix that? Well, probably more. It's only got 10% infill, more infill. There's a million things to play with. But that I can make large parts like this. Let's see if I, well, you can see in the other cameras, right? But let's, the other thing that happened, there we go. Right, this is this is just amazing to me. And of course, oh, there's more, you know, uh, there's a piece out here that holds the camshafts and a trap door that goes in the back here that does its thing. But just that I can get this far and physically see something, I'll be able to take these. You know, you, 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 I might be able to mount a flywheel in it, not that I'd want to, maybe just to check to see that spacing's right for the chain. I, I use the Browning catalog to figure out the spacings. But that's an important thing to check out. I, I found out I didn't model. There's a little connector on the bottom of this, uh, of this starter motor here. Didn't model it, and guess what? It, it won't bang into this part of the case half. But when I use this transmission jig, I realized I have to do some relief for that little connector on the trap door that sits right here. It's about that thick. So that needs to be done. It taught me that. So that alone was worth it. But the other cool thing, I've got, I bought the bolts and I'll bolt this thing together. I can go to a frame now and I can make sure that this thing, which is weak, you know, cheesy plastic, I can make sure that the motor fits in the frame. And that's one of the big advantages of moving, uh, let me turn it some more. Of, of moving this clutch forward, because in an old Sportster, the clutch basket bangs into the pivot for the swing arm. So by moving this forward, redesigning, the riskiest thing I'm doing is a redesign of that shifter mechanism. That's why I built this jig. So I'm not going to try to do that on a closed thing with thousands of dollars spent in billet aluminum. So when I figure out that shifter, then I'll do a final pass on these, probably print it again, make sure everything fits and goes together. I'll get the oil system all figured out and fixed. But moving this forward means that 
the, the clutch basket, the back of this basket, doesn't bang into the pivot. So if you wanted to, one day, that's why there's multiple holes back here, if you wanted to, you could mount this in the center because the way the old sportsters are, the center of the flywheel, the center of the piston, is not over the, the, the frame center. It's pushed off to the side because that clutch basket has to be clearanced from the swinging arm. This motor solves this. You could move the whole motor over so it fits perfectly in the frame, you know, in the right axis, the right plane. And that means you could, of course, that's going to change everything going to the back, but you could run a much wider tire, which is a cool guy thing to do. So with multiple holes, it's up to you. You could mount it in the stock position or move it over. All this will get figured out because I can take this and mount this in a, in a frame. I got early model fra frames, late model frames. Uh, this pocketing, I can make sure that the covers are going to work. My goal was to be able to take the starter motor off without removing this primary cover. All that's going to get figured out. And I'll figure it out in cheap plastic. It takes a while to do, but I got to love this 3D printer. It was a very good decision to do it. If you've got a project, something this big, well, uh, Creality is the, the cheapest one I've found. Uh, after this, I might go, it's, it's rocking here because there's a stud sticking out. It's, it's flat. The, the big piece is flat. Uh, there's a rail core machine, but it's not big enough for this. If I was going to do, I got cylinder heads to prototype. I got other things to prototype. If I could get that rail core up to 500 millimeter bed size, then I could make this in a more precise machine. I don't know that I need to. Right now, maybe I'd be better off spending my money and time, more importantly, on getting billet parts made and making sure that everything fits there and everything's going to work. So that's what the Creality CR10S S4 has done for me. It's gotten me this far. And I'll keep you posted as I make progress. I've got a Harley website where the actual design effort and the solid works and all that's going to go for this. And uh, I'll cross link if you're interested. So catch you next time. Thanks for paying attention. Sorry it's a long video, but thought you'd be interested. It's it touched on a lot of stuff. And next, change colors and start building all the other stuff for this motor. I'll catch you next time. Thanks a lot.